In the world of organized crime, a lot of criminal gangs have risen up. It doesn't matter in whatever corner of the world, there has been an organization that has risen up, that has been conducting organized crimes in one way or the other. But among the world organizations of organized crime, the mafians of Italia, uh, or we can call them the African Mafia, uh, the, uh, the, the American Mafia has always remained to be at the top of the chain link because of how the mafioso is structured. You can call them, them the mob as they are called in America. Now, today we are looking at the Mongiki. Mongiki is a sect in Africa and in a country in East Africa called Kenya. The Mogiki began as a local militia in the 1980s in the Kikuyu Highlands to safeguard the interests of the Kikuyu people against the then the Maasai that were fighting against the Kikuyus and also the Kalejins who then were the ruling and were the most in the government then ruled by the then president of the Republic of Kenya, Daniel Toritich, Arab Moai. So the Mungiki structure and how they operated, I always link the Mungiki existence as an influence of the mafioso or the mafia of Italy and America. You know, the mafia is organized in families. You have heard of the Gabino family. You have heard of the Gatlin family. The Philadelphia Mafia. The New York Mafioso. You have heard of different Mafia families in America. If you are a, a person that loves watching documentaries, then these are stories that are always on social media, on YouTube, or maybe on Netflix or other uh, film distribution platforms, you will find them there. So I have done research in comparison of the Mongiki and the Mafia, and I realized there is no big difference. The difference is that the Mongiki operated in Kenya, and they operated in a very cultural way. The Mafia also in America have currently evolved in different ways but they always remain to be attached to their cultures in Italy because the mafia began in 1846 in Italy. Right now the mafia is over 160 years. You get. So the, the government outlawed the sect of Mongiki. The government outlawed the sect of Mongiki in the year 2002 in Kenya, after the then new president Mwai Kibaki, also a Kikuyu, had taken over the government. You know, the Mungiki is a sect that has currently been mentioned so much in Kenya due to rumor from the current regime led by President William Ruto that the former Mungiki leader Maina Jenga has currently started the recruitment of the Mongiki in Kenya again, which has arisen and brought fear among the Kikuyu people. And mostly, let me say, the Deputy President of the Republic of Kenya has instilled a lot of fear in the people from the Kikuyu people, from the Mount Kenya region, because recently he has been reminding them of the things that happened when Mongiki took over the Kikuyu Highlands. So I've told you, the Mafia operated in families, but their tools of operation, the Mafia did provide protection in the areas that they were situated. The Mafia had, a, had an organization, a fully registered organization. That is where the problem of the Mungiki comes in. Mungiki, yes, it had an organization. It was recognized by the government then because it started as a local militia in the 1980s. 
So what happened with the Mungiki is revolution came in and the oppression from the then ruling government by President uh, Daniel Moy, the Mungiki realized we are being so much pushed to the wall by the government of Moy. So for us to retaliate and operate and become functional, we cannot only operate by safeguarding our business interest in the Mount Kenya region only. So the Mungiki started moving into Nairobi, the capital city of Kenya. They started moving into Nakuru. They started moving into Kisumu. They started moving into Mombasa. And they started moving into other cities around Kenya, where now their main aim was to spread and take over the country. With the influence of their leader, Maina Jenga, and how they operated, they were ready to overthrow the government then and take over this country because Moi had become a man that had terrorized, terrorized the country for so long. He ruled the country under dictatorship, under the one-party rule, which made the Mungiki formulate new ways because the Kikuyu people are the biggest ethnic group in Kenya. And what happened is, once we are the biggest ethnic group in Kenya, we expect at least to find ourselves in leadership. But now this man, after the first president of Kenya, Jomo Kenyatta, died, he took over the government. As he has not given way to us as the Kikuyu, as the people that were supposed to be in power. If it's not for death that came and took President Jomo Kenyatta Hali, then you would not become the president. There would be an election and I don't think you would have won. That's how the, the Mungiki operated. So that's how they believed. So they had to formulate ways to kick out Moi out of the government. So even in the coup that was organized in 1982, the Mungiki was also at the center of that coup. The coup that was organized by the then Air Force of the nation, the, 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 the current opposition leader in Kenya, Raila Odinga, Mungiki were at the center of it. So when I speak about Mungiki, Mungiki's influence was in the government. One thing with the mafia and the differences with Mungiki, they don't really trust the government. They don't really do business with the inner circles of the government. Who they do business with is the police, because the police are the ones that are always arresting the mafias when they carry out their businesses. And most mafians operate by the distribution of heroin and cocaine. Mungiki operated in safeguarding people's properties. So they would come. The problem with Mungiki is that the, their physical outlook, their signature was the dreadlocks. The mafia's signature was a well black suit, a well-kept polished black suit with black leather shoes. You get? The mafia's Dressed so decently, Mungiki dressed like hooligans. Mungiki dressed like hooligans. That's where the difference came in. Now the mafias would take hold. They would take hold. But not many mafians were so much dedicated to the hold that they took. Let me tell you about the Mungiki hold and how they did the induction into their cult. It is just like a cult. The Mungiki would take a blood hoard where they would drink blood. They took an oath of secrecy. They took an oath of protecting the businesses of the people. They took an oath of protecting each other. They took an oath of remaining loyal to the sect no matter what. So that's why I tell you, the Mungiki learned these ways from the mafias. They copied the way the mafioso operated. And that's why, up to now, the mafia has been terrorized and beaten down in the United States of America and also in Italy. 
but still mafia as influence it can at least mafia can rise in no time and become a whole organization it's the same thing with the mongiki when you hear the deputy president and the president speaking about an existence of an outlawed sect called mongiki again in kenya at certain times when politics is so much a very hot topic in kenya you should consider that they really know what they are talking about and once these people come back you all know how they do their thing you know you know you all know how they operate the reason mongiki instills fear into people is because we can remember the madira massacre i shall remind you of the madira massacre the madira massacre led to the loss of over 29 lives and this was a revenge mission by the mongiki because some of their members had been killed by the nyumbakumi initiatives that was protecting the the their villages against the existence of mongiki in the mount kenya region where the war began between mongiki and the people is that mongiki at a certain time began to seek money from people they would ask for protection for you from people so that they will guide their business they would ask for protection fee so that the matatus would operate i mean the the psvs the public service vehicles would operate and once you refuse to give and add over that money to them and they were taking that fee either daily or on weekly basis so that's where now people became intimidated with this sect you know mongiki did not have guns mongiki used to weapons like machetes and knives so once you refuse to pay they would come in the middle of the night vandalize your place maybe even when they catch up with you they will kill you they will cut you and you will do nothing that's why the government now and the people now the people once you push people have always told you this once you push a person to the wall even it doesn't matter how weak and defenseless they are they will think of a way to retaliate they will think of a way to fight back mm. you know we africans during the colonial times we believed that the white men had come with education they had come with new things to give to us they had come to educate us on the ways of the world they had come to at least open our brains and our sight to new things they brought a lot of things but the thing that we held dear most is what they took away from us and that is our beliefs and also our land you know the white man came and instilled something I, i i always find something that mongiki did very functional then mongiki used to to at least instill the cultural beliefs of the kikuyu people back to them and tell them to abandon the ways of the white people because the westernization of kenya made us forget where we came from you know back then we used to offer sacrifices to our gods burnt offerings burnt sacrifices and they came to us and told us about the existence of Jesus Christ they told us about the bible and everything in existence and we bought that but we forgot our ways how we operated we also believed in the existence of god when these people were not there and we did worship our god in a different way but we decided to worship our god in their way you get and when somebody is pushed to the wall the the kemadi the, the and his brother and a kina general by mungi and field marshal moriama these people retaliated because this people had started taking our wives and kids and making them dig their farms these people had started using our wives and kids as sex slaves so that's when we couldn't take that no more we can't take that no more so we have to retaliate and 
our retaliators fight back and that's what happened with Mungiki. Mungiki pushed people to the wall. Mungiki assassinated people. Mungiki. Let me tell you one thing with Mungiki. Until now, tell me of how many members of the Mungiki have you ever seen come out in public and give the real details about what used to happen within Mungiki. You've seen a few people uh, uh, not a few, two leaders of the Mungiki group. That is, Maina Jenga. Maina Jenga has spoken about Mungiki, but Maina Jenga has never really touched about the in-depths of Mungiki. He has never, because he also took an oath of secrecy, and they believed in that oath. There is the other one, Apostle Dora Warungi. He was also a boss of the Mungiki. You know, we say about a boss of the Mungiki, Mungiki had bosses, the same as the mafias. You have heard of the boss of the mafias, the, 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 the Bonina, Bonino family, the Bonino boss, the Bonino crime family. Those are the names that represented those that guarded the mafia families. So Dora was a boss in the Mungiki. But when you speak with Dora, because I've done interviews with Dora Warwinge, Dora speaks about Mungiki in a very shallow manner. They don't touch in depths of the Mungiki. They don't get to dig inside the Mungiki. The reason I'm telling you that Mungiki is very sacred, during the, 20, the 207 and 208 post-election violence, People were called to the Hague, and some of them were the former president, Uhuru Kenyatta, and the current president, William Ruto. So, the Hague sent a team of investigators in Kenya to do the investigation on the existence of Mungiki. And once they came in Kenya, these people paid their ways they would give a lot of money so that they would get the real information about Mungiki. But the real Mungiki members were not, even if you would pay them how much, they were paid a lot of money, but they were not ready to share the details because they knew once they share those details, it would have costed them their lives. It would have costed them to lose that sacred all that they took. You get now, the main aim of the Mongiki was to call Kikuyus back to their cultures and abandoning the Western ways. Sources have always recognized Maina Jenga as the leader of Mongiki. Maina was arrested in the year 2006 and was released in 2009 after threats of ratting out leaders in the government that were funding the Mongiki. So, in the year Back in the year 2000, there was a drama that followed from the year 2006 to the year 2012 and 2013. You get. As Maina Jenga was fighting for Mongiki and fighting for the Kikuyu people, there arose certain things. Maina Jenga, and there was a rumor that the government was funding Mongiki, that big political big wings were inside the organization of Mongiki, they had taken the oath with Mongiki. So once Maina Jenga was arrested and he stayed in prison for some time, when he was being taken to court, he was supposed to rat out, he was supposed to give the real information. And then from orders from above came to the then Antony General Amos Wako to withdraw the case that is facing Maina Jenga and let Maina Jenga free. That's how influential Mongiki has been in this country. So, the, the organization of Mongiki, let me give you the structure organization of Mongiki. Mongiki is divided into regionals, districts, and the local levels. The regionals are led by political bigwings from the Kikuyu community. That's how it operated. The Mungiki regions were led by the political bigwings. 
and then from the regionals the districts were led by chairmen or bosses that's why you hear maina jenga being called the chairman maina jenga that's how you have heard youths call him that several times people like maina jenga now those who are the next maina jenga was the next he was the chairman he was the one answerable to to the commanders and the, and the, the the regional leaders the political big wings now from the gen, from the, the from the chairman the next in command was the generals the generals were answerable to maina jenga and the general led a group of over the groups over the districts so the generals would gather information and also would gather the money that had been collected and then take the money to the chairman the chairman would then decide on the distribution of the cash that had come in that's how it was structured and then from the from the generals some of the generals you have heard their names like the former spokesperson of mongiki that was murdered uh, people like Uh, somebody like Dora Warwinge now from the generals we had the lieutenants of the field marshals the field marshals these were now the local citizens and these comprised of a group of 10 to 50 people 50 youths whether male or female So the field marshals would execute the orders coming from their generals or their chairman. If they are told to hit Moranga, to hit Nairobi, to go and collect money in Dandora, they were supposed to do that and they wouldn't ask any question. They were not supposed to ask any questions. And they used machetes. They used pangas. This type of weapons. These are the weapons that they used. And there are those that also were uh, were licensed to have guns because you know they were they had connection with political big wings so the politicians would give them access to weapons so when you see the government right now running after maina jenga capturing maina jenga and he is taken to black sites he is hidden from the public limelight for some time until Uh, they ensure that the the political atmosphere is cooled down they really know why they are doing that with somebody like maina jenga the police are not foolish yeah although i have always said i despise the intelligence of our nation because the intelligence of our nation means restructuring and it means recruiting special special people with special talent of investigation because investigations means talent not just waking up and saying because my dad is the commander of of the, of the Kenya army now I, i why don't i be an intelligence service service officer that's what my, as real you know william root operates the I don't know is it an obsession with the police service of this country because they always sometimes way of the most combat the, the most dangerous combat team the rescue squad these people respond their access to weaponry and their operation techniques through on weaponry they are very talented they have they source the best you get because let me tell you people reason in this country somebody like maina jenga who we have spoken on the mongiki such a person shouldn't be a normal person that should be a brain that would have been absorbed into the government long time ago because of his knowledge and his way of ruling and absorbing people So this guy would be a commander of the KDF or something and it would be beneficial to this country. People criminals that you have seen come and go. People like Akina Maderi, Wanogo, Washosho, Rasta, uh 
the jackal himself. How did we call him? The guy that escaped to commit a maximum prison three times. Let me tell you, these brains are in the streets of Nairobi. These brains are in the streets of Kisumu, streets of Nakuru. But the recruitment of these hooligans seated with their big tummies in the government offices never think about how we will grow this country on a top notch. They always think, what will I eat next? Uh, should I fly to Dubai, Mozambique? Should I fly to South Africa, Cape Town, go hang out with small girls? That's what they think about. Even the, you know, I've spoken this several times and I will tell you, the countries that are ranked superpowers and developed countries in the world is because they don't reason with their stomachs, they reason with their brains and they reason. The, the power in military is what gives a country its power. The power in military is what makes a country a superpower. A country like Israel is considered a superpower. This is a country that got independence so much behind after we had already gotten our independence. Israel was a country that was so small, they did not have productivity in their land. They were buying fertile soil from Kenya, flying it to Israel. Look at Israel right now. It's considered a, a developed country, a superpower, country in possession of nuclear warheads and nuclear weapons. Come to my country, Kenya. We have everything it takes. We have everything it takes. But come and fight some individuals in the government only thinking with their stomachs. Hooligans. Hooligans. You know, we should, for somebody like this guy, we know our president is a genius. We know that. We have the best president that we can ever have. That is Mr. William Samuel Root. But this guy, he has been disturbed by people around him. The corruption schedule around him makes him only think of how to counter the opposition, not on the terms of development. I always give knowledge because knowledge is what god has blessed me with nothing else for now that's what's up go ahead and subscribe to fm show my name is felix wonder why is coming and we shall always be here